the Around the NFL podcast. Needs a sleepover at Mark's Man Cave. <laughs> Welcome to another edition of Around the NFL. My name is Dan Hansis, and I got heroes here. Greg Rosenthal and Mark Sessler. Sess Dog, do you got a man cave? I've been to your place. Um, I don't recall there being a, 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 a dedicated man cave, nor have I ever seen you as a man that would go man cave if given the opportunity. I mean, I think like you could reference the whole place as that on its on from some angle, but um, no, within the within the apartment, uh, I don't have a room that would be called classically a man cave at the moment. But you've you know before the show, you were if you're on YouTube, you're talking about my background that looks a little Spartan, could use a little bit of help. So the place is in development, I'd say. I, and Greg, you know, because Greg's gonna Greg, and he was labeling it as constructive criticism and that certainly was not what i was going i was offering a suggestion that maybe your remote background because that's what we're doing the show remote uh for the next couple days that it maybe could use a touch of color on the wall and i thought that would go a long way uh not criticism merely uh uh, unsolicited uh advice slash suggestion i i did not take it um purely as critique i understand what greg was attempting to uh, accomplish there verbally, um, but I didn't fall for that either. So, uh, you know, point and pointer taken. And I, you know, I, I look at my own setup and it does look, um, it looks a little suspect. It could use a little bit of, just a little bit of life. And I, I'm going to work on that this off season. It's not, it's not normal criticism though. It's constructive criticism. That's the gentleman's criticism. Like if he's a man, a man manly enough to even have a man cave, he can take some constructive criticism. Yeah, but I don't I have don't the man like cave, the so maybe I can't take the criticism. But I, I am in this case, I can. And uh, and lest lest we forget, I mean, silly me. Uh, not only does Mark have a man cave, he has an entire Super Bowl segment based around it. That's true, and that went very well. Uh, now it's time for a trip to Mark's man cave, brought to you by Devlin McGregor. <laughs> I forgot the Devlin McGregor the. The crooked pharmaceutical giant from The Fugitive uh, sponsored your segment. Well, the greatest part of that segment, beyond they the fact the that samples. I, have, I have no memory of it because of the state of my health that day, but um, that Denzel Ward and Miles Garrett um, were were not wearing like the cans, so they mm. couldn't they couldn't hear they couldn't even hear any of that. So the, 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 it, the, Greg, I'll never forget the anxiety coursing through Mark. Uh, in addition to the the germs. Uh, due to his illness ahead of that uh, interview with two Browns greats. And speaking of uh, anxiety, I want to bring in uh, the fourth person on today's show. You know her. You love her. You've missed her. Colleen Wolf. Connie's the queen. She is the queen of NFL yeah. media. That's how I get brought in. Speaking of anxiety, great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how you been, Colleen? Anything new going oh on the last couple God. weeks? You know what? No, I've just been laying real low, real <laughs> low, just chilling. A lot of just not doing anything, really. <laughs> I can't wait until but, we um, write the the Around the NFL memoir. That's all I'm going to say. But it's so good to see you. Darn. Hey, it's so great to be back. Um, <laughs> guys, I've missed you. Uh, I'm preparing for a soft launch of the Summer of Connie and then oh, hell yeah. we'll go into full swing right after the draft. So it's uh, this, these are big months, a uh, huge lead up to what's going to be an amazing summer. Are you doing the draft night stage thing again? That's a big spot. I am. Draft night Ooh, stage thing. That's nice. I, that's exactly <laughs> what they call it. Um, so yeah, I will be in Detroit on stage for night one. And then I wanted to do day three because they're doing puppy adoptions. <laughs> and so oh. I've never done day three before. So I'm going to skip night two and then stay for all of the shenanigans on day three are we gonna maybe leave there with a puppy i don't know how i don't leave without a puppy so we're gonna see what happens but i'm gonna probably get my pick of the litter since i'll be with them backstage and that's kind of my dream is to just be in a green room with a bunch of puppies so that sounds great. And then like, will the inevitable party at your compound occur? Like how many hours after you return from the draft? Roughly minutes, moments, (laughs) seconds. Okay. It's it already starts on the flight home. (laughs) You know, 
my beloved dog captain, uh, who's now about 16, 17 months old, but um, shortly before Christmas 23 uh, or 22, uh, Emily and I uh, went to this, um, oh, I should give them a shout out because they do really uh, great work here in terms of serving as foster a foster home for pets here in the South Bay and in the Los Angeles area. Um, but we went over to the, this this uh, couple's home, and there they were in the laundry room. It was Captain as a you know th- uh, three week old puppy, and then three other uh, siblings of his. So it was a it was a female puppy, and then uh, three males. And here's the one advice I'll give Connie. Okay. That we picked Captain. We, initially, we wanted to get the girl dog, but she was totally insane. Uh, Emily wanted to get a girl, <laughs> but she was nuts. Okay. And you could tell she was the Pied Piper and she was a maniac. And we're like, all right, that, I love the dog, but we can't pick it. The other two dogs were various levels of overactive. And Captain, as a puppy, was chilling way in the back and hiding and acting really low key. Aww. And we're like, that's, that's the puppy we want. But I'll tell you something, Connie. We got that little bastard home. And immediately he morphed into the other two brothers, total maniac. And we, we yeah. wouldn't have him any differently, but they are smart enough, even as puppies, to, to con you and sell you. So just be Wait, can I ask you a question, yeah. though, Dan? You like, think is he it, was conning you? He just wasn't like time. tired at the moment? Greg, he just I am, something? <laughs> Greg, I am telling you, dude, the, that dog was straight up acting to separate himself from the pack. And he is a very intelligent canine. So I, I really give him that benefit of the doubt. Wait, can I ask you a question? Like, is it possible? And I'm, I'm, this is a theory, and we don't always agree with each other's um, theories. And it's not; it's also not Oswald a critique. acted alone. Go on. It's yeah. not a critique, but um, <laughs> I is it possible that Captain is maybe a little less, um, or maybe a little more emotionally dense, and wasn't aware like the other three dogs that they were the, the, the siblings were about to be separated, where the other three are reacting. Then Captain gets home and realizes he no longer has his siblings you know and I is acting need, up. I'll tell you what, Mark. I love you, buddy, but I don't need a cat guy telling me anything about the the nature of the dog, uh, uh, an advanced I, I, species. I'm asking. I, I didn't tell you. I, I I'm asking the question, and it was crit, you know constructive criticism, as Greg would would say, or just a question. That Dan, does feel I was like trying criticism. to find. I was trying to find the <laughs> rescue that because you said it to me before and was telling me like that's yes. that uh, after uh, Blitzen. So I was actually looking at that rescue a bunch. They have the cutest dogs, but I can't find it now. But I will tell you that uh, my w- I'm did... going to text my wife and we're going to get it. Yeah. All right, let's get on track. We okay. got a good app today. Um, it, we're going to talk about uh, front offices, GMs, you know, coaches with pop, owners, obviously the decision makers of the organizations that dot the NFL, uh, who's under the most pressure heading into uh, draft weekend. And uh, but before that, we're gonna hit some news. Let's get caught up. Now third down and thirteen. Blitz coming. Prescott able to get out of the end zone, and now airs it out for Lamb. He's got it. He's gone. When he gets there, it's a touchdown. Cowboys on top. C.D. Lamb from 92 yards out. Those, Although I I do, and we're going to get to the NFL conquering the days of the week again uh, in a few minutes, uh, but um, I really do enjoy those late regular season Saturday night games where, like, Daddy can have a couple Tito's. My sons are with me. We don't get to watch football <laughs> enough due to the nature of our jobs. And when, like, a really exciting play happens like that, uh, it, it kind of electrifies the house. I was that was one, and I'm everyone knows that listens to this pod. I love me some CD Lamb. Uh, in what was a brilliant season, that game he was an absolute monster, and now the Cowboys are dealing with the repercussions of a being a monster because you got to pay him like a god. I'm still a little stuck on you know you calling yourself our daddy, but I <laughs> I do want to move on because that that highlight I think was the first time this off season that I saw a highlight from the season and like. For the few weeks afterwards, I got to admit, like seeing highlights from the season, it almost gives me the chills. Like, oh, remember that back then? It was just like you were in a totally different mindset. But now teams have showed up. They've started working out. Football is back. I I was excited to see an NFL highlight there. Let's go. Uh, Mark is going to reach through your monitor and and put an end to your jugular. (laughs) They're working out. We got Kirk Cousins doing interviews in the Falcons facility. They're, They're there. Football is back. All right. And we 
just lost Colleen. Hopefully we'll get her back. Connie has technical difficulties from time to time on these uh, remote shows, but we'll hopefully we'll get Colleen back. Uh, and if we don't, it was great seeing her, and she'll be back soon enough. Let's get into the CD Lamp story here, which is, I don't know if I'd call it thorny, but it's its on the radar, and it's worth talking about. The Dallas Morning News uh, reported that there is, quote, uh, NFL precedent for C.D. Lamb not taking the field until he signs a contract extension. He's entering the fifth and final year of his rookie deal, uh, but he is one of the best wide receivers in football. We just talked about it. He's coming off an incredible season uh, where he posted career highs in receptions, 135 receiving yards, 1749 touchdowns, 12. So he's a first-time All-Pro He deserves a contract that matches uh, that. uh, And yet the Cowboys are just in slippery uh, conditions here, Mark, with their salary cap, with what's going on with uh, Micah Parsons, with Dak Prescott. In some ways, it's a good problem to have. But also, in other ways, you're seeing the challenges of a team with top flight stars bunched together. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, this stuff happens. There is a precedent. I, I like that word attached to this. But they've gotten to this point with those three players you mentioned, like Prescott, Parsons and Lamb, where all all of them need their contracts to be addressed, and it for all the business and hype around the Cowboys, um, it just feels kind of like bad business, like a little bit disorganized because these wide receivers each year get incrementally so much more expensive that you could have done this before, you could have found a way to do this before, like the whole Dak thing. I'd say the same thing. It's like quarterback wide receiver becoming incredibly inflated price wise and. I think it's Lamb's prerogative to say, look, I want to be paid like what I am, which is one of the top receivers in the league. And you're not going to have my services without that money. And if you look at what else they have on the depth chart, um, they don't really have another choice but to make it happen. It's just part of the offseason playbook right now. I mean, skipping offseason workouts, they're voluntary anyways. If he skips a mini camp or not, it's not that meaningful. If he starts taking into training camp, again, that's part of the playbook. It's it's a catch-22 with this fifth-year option. You retain his rights longer than if he was a second-round pick, but they just never want to play on that fifth-year option if they're the kind of player that C.D. Lamb is. He's made a total of $14 million in his four years, which is you know great money for a normal person, but for the level of production that he's had, you know it's minuscule. They will get the deal done. They don't have a ton of cap space, but I do think the Dak Prescott situation is looming over this that they in my mind are going to choose on some level to pay cd lamb first and wait and see how dak prescott does this year and i think it's meaningful with the draft coming up uh because i just look at a fairly deep quarterback class and i I know they don't have a high pick and yeah i just look at like the model that the packers have shown and i've To me, it's not crazy for the Cowboys to be considering taking a quarterback in this class. And part of that equation, I think, is CeeDee Lamb's going to get his money. It's just a matter of time. We don't need to spend, like, a crazy amount of time this offseason, even though I suspect it will go into training camp or something like that. And this is, you know, the Cowboys are a victim of their own success uh, on some level, but also it's another reminder. And it's like, you know, you saw with the Diggs trade and and the Bills in some ways, and you look at their roster and, and what they're doing now, they're trying to reload on the fly with the star quarterback uh, that the Cowboys had their window. Like they had it like that. When you hit on Parsons lamb and Dak, you had that three or four years where that's when you go and you win Super Bowls and they weren't able to get over the hump in the NFC. And it doesn't mean that they can't contend for the Super Bowl again, even this year, but now it's getting increasingly more difficult. And uh, uh, Parsons is a top five, maybe even top three player, Uh, maybe the number one player at his position. Lamb, you can make the same case for his position. These are two of the highest paid positions in the sport. And then Dak, maybe not top five, but probably a top 10 quarterback, and he's a QB. So that's the highest paid position in the sport. So it's almost a perfect storm, Mark, kind of which I'm less feeling critical of the Cowboys, but that they didn't get the job done uh, winning and now they have to find a way to pay these three dudes at like the most expensive price tags in the sport. And it's kind of impossible. Yeah. And I think like, I mean, it, there's no way to really um, shape shift the message to not say that Dallas has had an awkward 
um, unpredictably strange offseason um, that, that I guess to starts goes against the actual messaging of what they claim to be this offseason. And I'm with Greg, though. I mean, we can uh, let this one go until he gets paid. I, you know, the Chris Jones holdout last, last year was one of the rare ones where like a star isn't there when the season starts. I typically just tend to think these things get ironed out, but um, they're in a thorny, sp- they're in a thorny spot. Yeah. I think the story here is not the idea of will CD lamb play for the Cowboys. Will he show up and more just like the bigger yeah. picture uh, situation around the Cowboys. Uh, yeah. He said, right. by the way, to TMZ, I'll be in Dallas, which was like a clever non-answer to like, yeah, you'll be in Dallas. You live there, but he wasn't saying he was showing up to practice necessarily. Yeah. Parse that Harvey Levin. <laughs> All right. <laughs> In other news, uh, we told you, NFL won. They've defeated days of the week. Uh, there's no longer any issue. Uh, you could play an NFL game whenever you want, and uh, nice. issues with competition be damned. Uh, they, there will be a, a way and a, a streaming platform that will air it. And uh, let's talk about week one. It's going to have a new wrinkle. There's a lot of new wrinkles with the schedule now because everything's been blown wide open. The Eagles will play the NFL's first game in Brazil to kick off 2024 and yes they will do it on a friday night so now we get the thursday night opener we're gonna have a this is the brazilian national anthem by the way Hmm. we're going to have thursday night opener we're gonna have friday night we're gonna have a dozen games on sunday and then games on monday so you do the math that's four out of seven in one week of football so the eagles last played an international game in 2018 uh, will face a to-be-announced opponent in San Paulo Friday, September 6th, uh, the day after the NFL season kicks off on Thursday night. So it will be the NFL's first Friday game on an opening weekend in more than 50 years. Mark, what was happening 50 years ago when they last played? <laughs> I mean, I was born 50 years ago, so I think that was probably one of the bigger news items in the country. Yeah, I was just saying it was in your life cycle, so not Greg and I, so I didn't know if you knew who were the... The team's Did playing. they have TV back then? Did you watch it? Uh, there was a, a form of television back in the in the early 70s, Greg. Uh, I, Roger uh, Goodell had this to say, by the way. We are just incredibly enthusiastic about our growth on a global basis. Same Z's. Yeah. I was curious because I saw our uh, frequent guest, Andrew Marchand, ask the question, is the NFL even popular in Brazil? And I know it is popular to some degree, but I wasn't sure as much, but... The NFL says that Brazil has the third most amount of fans in the entire world. Number one, U.S. Number two, Mexico. They credit 30 million fans in Brazil. Now, it's not a huge part of our audience because of the the language barrier, but bring it on, Brazilians. We're sending you a good game. It shows how much we respect Brazil to give them... Packers Eagles. I mean that that might be the best primetime game of week one. I, I also read that actually in Brazil that the Packers, um, you know, they probably looked into this, have one of the biggest, one of the biggest like fan fit the teams. The Packers are like a, like the second or third most popular team there. But you know, Dan, you said that they can play games any day. There is this um like age-old rule out there called the Sports Broadcasting Act of 1961, which happened before I was born. But um, you are not allowed to play <laughs> a game on Friday as of the second Friday in September. So what they've done is they've found these calendar openings where because Labor Day is happening on September 1st, 2nd, or 3rd, you can squeeze it in there. And they've noted that the other years that are eligible would be 2025, 2029, 2030, and 2031. So it's, they're not going to, they can't do Friday night every night, but when they find their way, they're going to squeeze it in there and disrupt your weekend, Dan. We'll see. We'll see, Mark. That well, was true. good reporting, though, by Sounded Mark. Sounded like a challenge, admit, Mark. Didn't know all that, and I think it was valuable to anyone making plans in for 2029. I could see the that league office like like burning them on that sports act, too. <laughs> um, all right, so, and thank you guys for giving me that information, that updated information about their opponent. That is exciting. Moving on. Josh Allen. No, the other Josh Allen, the one that plays for the Jaguars. Gets paid. He agrees to a new five-year, one hundred and fifty million dollar deal. Makes him one of the uh, makes him uh, one of the highest-paid players at his position in the league. It is a contract that includes eighty-eight million guaranteed, and it replaces the franchise tag that he was playing under that was set to pay him a little more than twenty-four million. Greggy Allen coming off his second Pro Bowl trip in five years. 
He is coming off a perfectly timed breakout year where he had 17 and a half sacks, 66 tackles, two forced fumbles, an interception, a uh, big time player. They nailed the draft pick. Uh, remember when he came into the league, it was like, oh, it's another Josh Allen. Is this the right play? And it turned out to be, yes, the right play. Right. He, he's sort of a classic example of a first round pick that was a, a big win, a B plus, a minus that like wasn't a superstar, but better than the average, like uh, and got better and better and developed, I think, and timed his best season for his contract year. And it just reminds me how important self scouting and getting ahead of all these contracts are because they could have paid they could have paid him so much less a year ago. And they could have paid him this contract months ago and then they could have kept Calvin Ridley, but they couldn't because then the franchise tag wasn't available and he ended up being able to squeeze him. It's a good thing though for players like franchise tag players. We saw with Kyle Duggar earlier this week are getting their long-term money, which is sort of how uh, it's intended to be used. But these quieter contracts, like the Eagles, for instance, with Dickerson and Mylotta, who are doing it years ahead, like those are the teams that are smart. They're saving money in the long run because this is pretty wild. Uh, I think it's 76 fully guaranteed, 88 guaranteed. Like he's getting that money. It's it's not backloaded at all. He actually has a chance to, to play a lot of this contract, I think, by the looks of it. And it links to exactly what we were just saying about Micah Parsons. I mean, these, right. the, the, it's it's exactly what Dallas has to look at and say, oh, we're going to have to top that. And like you're right, seven of nine tag players have gotten contracts um, and, and quicker than they would have in, in, in other times. So like, I, I like that's, that part of it. And the Jaguars needed to do this. I mean, they, uh, Calvin Ridley is not to me like a star wide receiver, but they are letting players go. And you're watching the AFC South, the Texans specifically, turn into a firestorm and you've got a wait and see on what Anthony Richardson makes the Colts. So it's like the Jaguars who, you know, 600 days ago were a really sexy new operation in the AFC are now like maybe the second or third, at least the second best team in the South, maybe the third. I was going to say, hold that thought, but it was too late. We'll talk about the Jaguars a little bit later. Oh. Potentially. Are we going to um, have a balky off? I mean, our multiple... <laughs> Co-hosts here. Uh, don't be don't ridiculous. Like uh, all right. Finally in the news. God, if there's one person out there that got that reference, please hit me up <laughs> I did. on social media. I, I enjoyed it. What? Go ahead. I mean, I do. I don't want to spell it out for the listeners out there that, you know, right, give me the, the letters. Balky Bartakamis, big okay. time yeah. fans. Okay. <laughs> the Bartaka heads out there. <laughs> Anyway, finally in the news, uh, Bill Belichick is about to enter an NFL season not as a head coach uh, or a coach of any kind, and that will be the first time since 1974, which predates Mark Sessler. No, mm. it, it is. I was, you know, on the earth to witness the start of that career for Bill Belichick. Man, this is like a whole fun game. Like, can we find an event in history where Mark wasn't alive? <laughs> Anyway, 50 years, okay? And uh, Belichick, though, is keeping busy. He recently spoke at Nebraska's annual coaching clinic. And, uh, you know, the, the head coach is an old man, uh, an old friend of uh, the show, uh, a guy that once stole Mark's heart at the NFL scouting combine at a uh, tavern, a local steakhouse. That is Matt Rule. Uh, he did not do well as a head coach in the NFL, but obviously he's landed on his feet well. And he was blown away by Bill Belichick's presence, his knowledge, his je ne sais quoi um, at this clinic. Let's listen to, to Rule, who also was very pointed in his commentary about Bill being out of work. And how is that possible? He is so smart. I've seen so much that he can make the complex so simple that it humbles you and embarrasses you. I was embarrassed yesterday listening to him, how smart he is, how simple it was. He went, which, what, what, he, how, how, we would, he, went, he went four and a half hours with, just with the coaches. Forget the clinic. Like He came in and met with our coaching staff. And um, well, three and a half hours in, I was like, Coach, would you like a water, a <laughs> coffee? Would you like to use the restroom? Because I desperately had to use the restroom, you know. And he's like, I'm fine, Matt. I was like, yes, sir. Um, and just sitting there and just talking, right? And just his recall from things 15 years ago. And, you know, the only reason why we don't get through more information is because he's having to slow down to make sure you understand what he's saying. I mean, so you have this man who's a savant, right? Who's been a defensive coordinator 
he's been a special teams coordinator. He's coached, you know, he could, he could be an offensive coordinator. He's been a head coach twice. He's been um, a GM person. I mean, he's – and he's talking about football in a way that just, like, I mean, illuminates things and makes things so simple that you're like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, I love that, and I, I wish things worked out better from that rule because he seems like a good guy and a personable guy uh, in the NFL. Uh, so – and some people – and I saw some – some you know criticism out there that uh, who cares what that guy says he, he's terrible at his job okay he was bad as a Panthers head coach but he's clearly someone who respects the profession that's done it for a long time and what he's telling you right there does that sound like an over the hill um, football man someone that doesn't have more to give to this league I think it's one of the great follies and and honestly the most ridiculous thing in all our time doing this podcast, which is we're going into our 12th season that Bill Belichick uh, wanted a job and did not get one this year. And that will probably be rectified next year, but let, let it be remembered when the next round of firing and firings and dismissals goes down that a lot of those teams had a chance uh, to get Bill Belichick and instead chose to outthink themselves. I could, I could see one, um, you know, silver lining here for Belichick because it's pretty um, trenchantly noted that when coaches take a year off, um, they, their health improves. Uh, they're able to watch football more globally. I mean, it's, you're not going to teach Bill Belichick new things. I get that. But just the idea of kind of getting out of the grind, um, re-energizing, taking a look, look at football from a different place. And I think for Belichick to go around to these, you know, these coaching clinics and to talk to other coaching staffs, it's got to be fuel for him. And I think it takes the hot butt rankings and everyone who's on that list, it dials the notch up because whatever exhaustion or ageism was happening around Bill Belichick a couple of months ago at the end of the New England thing um, and the, the documentary that came out, all that, it's like other owners are now going to be like, wait a minute, everyone passed on Bill Belichick. But if I'm like the Giants owner, I'm like, we could bring Belich mm -hmm. Bill Belichick back to New York to be the Giants coach in a, in, a, in a bit of poetry if this thing continues to go south. So I think everyone's now about to be watching that. Like, wait a minute, Belichick is already the lead candidate to take a job a year from now. Like, th that's all stuff I agree with from both of you. And yet I don't think it was some travesty he didn't get hired. He needed a year off. What he was doing was stale. He was doing a poor job. I think it's going to be extremely valuable for him to take a step back and do some self-accounting of how he went 29 and 38 with no playoff wins for four years, three out of four losing records. Like, because there's no way he is happy with that. And he is as critical as it gets. And I randomly like reread a uh, critical of himself as he gets, as he used to be. I, I reread this book, Patriot Reign, which is one of the great season in the life embedded reporter books that kind of got slept on. It's Michael Holly, who spent two seasons all sorts of inside stuff with the Patriots, 2002, 2003. It's kind of amazing. It's like him going to Belichick's cousin's house with Belichick when she has cancer, all this stuff. And the, like the number one thing that he stressed that he like was important to him was to not have yes men around him, to have people around him that he respected that could push back on what he said because it can't just be one person running the show. Like it, it, it can't just be one person. And Scott Pioli, especially in that book, was really important as someone who he trusted to do a lot. And he loved how Mangini pushed back. And he said, I never want to be the type of leader that gets masturbatory. He used that word in terms of my opinions and no one's got, he didn't have to use that word, but he, he did. didn't, but it, he was. And, and what did he turn into? He turned into a guy who had, who started making all the decisions, had, had no one around him, didn't groom anyone that would push back. And he will, I'm sure reflect and say, I did a poor job for four years, 29 and 38 with, with three losing seasons is a bad job no matter what. And I think he'll come back a, a better coach. But it, to me, it's not some like, like he was a little, he needed to reset and, and change the way he was doing things. I know, but everybody, everyone seems to be so sure of their opinion that he needed to reset and he needed this year away. But he didn't, he didn't think it. And just because he, listen, he could have gotten a job in January and still done some self-reflection and self-scouting and went into this uh, uh, enlivened and re-energized and learning from what happened at the end of the New England run. And the idea, like, I think ageism played a part in the fact that he's in his early 70s. And now you're kind of, in some way, like the point I'm trying to make will be made in January when multiple teams want the guy. And it won't be because, like, oh, now he's had the year in, in head coach jail where he was able to, 
you know, come clean and and go to confession and and finally see the error of his ways. Like he's going to be the same guy, and he'll learn and he's learned some things away from the game. But I think he would have been learning and scouting himself either then way. Why because did he do that's such a is. bad job? Well, he. I mean, that's also under, I understand what you're saying, and you could point to the end of the run. He he also ended up with a a quarterback that couldn't really play, and that and that really shades things. I think if. If he ended up with a better quarterback prospect than Mac Jones, we probably aren't having this conversation. And that's not to put everything on Mac Jones uh, because he played a major role in Mac Jones. Uh, he was the face of the organization behind the scenes as well. I just, I still can't believe it. I don't want to dwell on it anymore. And I think we're all on the same page. I'm just a little more strident in my feeling that the teams, uh, these teams think they're so smart and it's a copycat league. And I think once, other teams kind of put it out there that, oh, we don't want that guy. He's he needs a good goods. team, he's though. A like, ass. I'm not assuming he's going to do well. The odds would say, like, he, he could be mediocre. And he again. loves that, Greg. A, a he, turnkey he might not talk team on like it, the Cowboys or the it. Jets, not like the Jets are going to hire him, but a team that actually has it in place. His mind is obviously so sharp. He's such a great defensive mind. Like, he can do all that. Running an organization, I think he showed that his best days are are behind him when it comes to that. He'll, he'll need to make some adjustments, obviously. But I and he's not somebody to speak on this. He's not going to do a a, land, a last dance Jordan thing and speak his mind on this stuff. But he loves like guys like national guys like a Greg Rosenthal who, who no one was ever more in his corner, saying he can't do it anymore. He's got to be in a, a perfect setup. He needs to kind of he can't run the show the like he used to. I think he's going to be hungry, and I think he would have been hungry this year too. I guess is my point. This idea that he needed to take the year off, well. He's getting the year off, and let's see what happens. Because I think a little all of it. I think a little bit of all of that can be true. Like the, the even if he didn't want the year off, it can help him. Um, like he can be doubted, but we don't. You have to look at the full body of work. He's one of the greatest coaches, if not the greatest coach of all time. And I find your versatility, Dan, to be impressive. That um, you can come out and uh, attack appropriately the ages <laughs> and the people that. Uh, you know, killed Bill for his age on a show where you're asking if I was here for uh, to that's, witness the Revolutionary War. So I that versatility point. is that's no a thing. fair point. I think that's versatility. A, I'll take. That's a good point, Marky. That's a I think fair. I think you're saying it's a little hypocritical. Versatile seems like the word. That's a nice guy move. I <laughs> fall on that sword, baby. All right, let's take a break, and uh, we will uh, talk about speaking of pressure and decision makers. Uh, who's under the most as we enter draft season. Welcome back. I'll tell you what, this sport is not for the meek of heart. And leadership in the front office, that holy trinity, owner, GM, head coach, all teams are, are different and who has the juice. But ultimately, there's always someone who's responsible who will be either celebrated or dragged through the mud for the draft. And then free agency is a, a test for these decision makers. But I feel like the real pressure point, the, the future of the organizations are really built on the back of these three days every April. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about right now. And that's why you're hearing that ominous synth, Mark Sessler, because I can only imagine. I mean, look at we just talked about Belichick. You, you, one day you're you're the goat. The next day you can't even get a job. Uh, and, and that's the pressure these guys are under. It's what have you done for me lately? And if you're coming off a so so draft, for instance, and there are a lot of co GMs and, uh, and front office leaders that are coming off so so to bad drafts. Man, you better hit on this one or you'll be joining Bill Belichick at the next mm. Corn Huskers uh, Summit. <laughs> if you're lucky. I think you're right. It's a stark, stark environment. Um, that's why and it, it seems to be happening a little bit less, but you got these like coaches that like to brag about being in the office 90 hours a week and GMs right now are doing the same thing. They don't see their families for four months. And I think the, the this this year, especially there's a lot of new GMs, but the pressure is turned up on some of them, but especially some of these guys that have been around for a while and there have been some disappointing tracks in the background. So this segment comes at the right time, Dan. Hmm. I don't want to get, you know, on this podcast especially, but I did hear one of the many of what, you know, a lot of new head coaches to make your point, Mark. I heard from a birdie that an example is one of the coaches 
toward the facility after being hired. And the first thing he asked was like, where are the beds? Where are the pullout couches uh, for my assistants? Uh, and you could infer quite easily what will be expected of that staff. And uh, the fact that the assistant coaching offenses didn't have a place to sleep meant that needed to be uh, handled, put it that way. So yes, th there's a lot of pressure all the way down the chain, but let's get into some teams and front office leaders uh, who are under the most pressure entering this draft. And Greg, why don't you get us going, throw, throw a team out there, we'll go around the horn. And by the way, for those that are wondering, Colleen Wolf still missing in action. Uh, we're gonna continue to track this uh, and hopefully she returns, uh, but hope is growing dim. Go ahead, Greg. All right, I'll, I'll save um, Bart Akamis for you because I'm, I'm that kind of teammate. And I want to mention a, a name I feel like has not been mentioned since the day he was hired. And uh, he's going to be drafting for the first time, actually. And he's not in a great spot. And yet I still feel like he's under a lot of pressure. His name is Dan Morgan. He's the mm. Panthers GM. Not getting a lot of pop, pop this offseason, the Panthers. Uh, not getting a lot of attention, partly because they don't have a first-round pick. But you know what they do as have is the first pick in the second round and then another pick six picks later in a draft that it's the perfect spot to have those two picks where people really feel like the strength of this draft is in the top 50 picks that the difference between let's say 15 and 50 is not that great and to me the Panthers have so many needs that he can put a little bit of a fire sale up for that 33 spot overnight and, and see what he can get for it and pick up more and more. They're thin everywhere. I love the Deontay Johnson move, uh, but Adam Thielen, you can't expect what you got out of him to happen again. Like he is a three in a perfect situation. You need more juice. You don't have a receiver. You don't have a tight end. Your left tackle from a couple of years ago has essentially been a bust and they're going to say that they love him, but they're going to need... Uh, another option there and then I look at their defense and they've added some like good just veteran players that kind of fill the the snaps Josie Jewell DJ Wanham Ashawn Robinson like clownies there like a bunch of solid guys who can who can play and they needed that but when you look on our lads which are, have my favorite depth charts you can see you know when they got drafted where they came from and I noticed like only three players on the Panthers starting defense were drafted by the Panthers. And, and one of them, Shaq Thompson, who was practically playing with Dan Morgan back when Dan Morgan was quite an exciting middle linebacker uh, back in the day. And so they need homegrown talent and they need to win fast because we've learned with that owner, like you might think you have a timeline. Dan Morgan's been in the building. He was part of the last regime. He's not going to have that long of a timeline and they just need to start finding some players, and I just wanted to say hello to the Carolina Panthers fans that listen to this show. I'm been with you because they've, they've been completely ignored. Hey guys. I, that is a <laughs> perilous spot because I think if you're a, anyone's going to want to try their test at being a GM, and it was kind of an uncreated, I, it's, I think Dan Morgan could be as good as anyone else somewhere, but it was a hire from within, which tells me sometimes about what the owner wants to be able to have control over. I don't know if that's the case here, but um, the odds on situation tells us that Tepper wants to have the strongest voice. You don't know if the quarterback can play. Um, you inherited a job where you have given away a ton of draft picks for the future and made a ton of terrible team building decisions over the last three or four years. That's why Matt Rule doesn't have a job. So it's like, I think Dan Morgan, like selling that, selling that pick maybe and acquiring ever, all the assets you can. Um, I, I agree with you, Greg. I think that makes sense. Yeah, because this is obviously the critical year for Bryce Young. It comes quick in the NFL. The number one overall pick coming off a nightmare rookie year. If he's bad again, very, very real chance that they just clean house. Two fifths, uh, as I mentioned, two high seconds, and then the first pick of the third. Like they keep like that third is almost as good as, as a late, you know, second. So he does have so, even though they they traded all those picks away, they have some maneuverability. They got to make it happen. Yeah, I'll throw one more before we throw it to Mark with his uh, pressure point. Uh, just a little. Uh, Greg, I like the way you did that. That was an optimistic type uh, way to to say hello to the Panthers fans. The one thing that you got to remember to do, no matter what, no matter what obstacles you face, no matter the hardships in your past, there's only one thing you got to do. A pounding. All right. <laughs> Been a while. I, you know, when you look at like the last Panthers GM, Scott Fitter, like, not surprising why he's not there anymore. 
I think there's one GM sitting out there that it's like, it is a surprise to me that he's still in the building. And it's George Payton, um, who I think we have a nickname for. Was it Kevin Saunders, I believe? That's it. Okay, so Kevin Saunders um, has enough on his resume where he shouldn't be there. I think he's got a he's got a head coach who essentially like probably runs that front office, um, if not directly, just sort of spiritually. And a head coach in Sean Payton, who's verbally, when whether I know Greg always thinks whatever Sean Payton is saying that he's lying, but. He says, you know, there are teams up there above us in the draft where they're at number 12 that we are, you know, trading up for a quarterback makes them very valuable uh, front offices and assets. And I think like you're looking at a team that has Jarrett Stidham and Ben DiNucci in a post Russell Wilson apocalypse. And there is a lot of pressure (laughs) to get up there and get someone if they don't like who's going to fall to them as the fifth or sixth guy. They do have more draft assets than you would think. But I think either way, if for some reason it doesn't go the way that Sean Payton um, wants, that Sean Payton has the easiest fall guy around. And there are, you know, once every couple of years, there is a team that cleans house in the front office right after the draft. And I could see that being a real problem for George Payton slash Kevin Saunders if it doesn't come out real well for them. I mean, they absolutely need it. I mean, if There's that's no- happening, the decision's already made. If It doesn't matter. They're not going to let him do anything on draft weekend if they're going to fire him. Well, now. so I'm saying I don't know if the decision's already made or if they maybe they work better together than we realized. I, I don't. I just think that the power structure puts him in a tough spot, and it's almost like you have someone you can blame other than Sean Payton if you're Sean Payton if it doesn't go well a couple weeks from now. I mean, you could almost like look at it a different way than Mark, like that, with especially these teams coming off disappointing years, there's not a lot of pressure. I mean, there's pressure to try to be better, uh, but if things go wrong, Sean Payton's pulling the strings anyway, and he could just blame the GM and start over there. And if, if things go right, uh, well, Kevin yeah. Saunders keeps his job most likely and McVay and, and Payton gets all the credit. I don't like the I don't like the power structure for George Payton to begin with. But I would say secondly, who like Kevin Saunders. But if you right. if you like go th- into another rough year with Sean Payton, I think things get real ugly. And it, you know, I just I just do. I just think that I think they've got to come out of this draft with a lot more hope than they are. That their roster to me on offense is just like, come on, guys. Like, and the drafts have not been great. They, it's like they've not had great drafts under Kevin Saunders. So it's like, Walmart? what's the track record here? Is a Walmart that that owns the Broncos? Yeah, yeah. The, I don't. We don't know yet how patient they are. We when we talked about the Russell Wilson trade, I I made my opinion that or shared my opinion that I thought if they're being run the right way, that Peyton should be mostly absolved of year one because he had to inherit the Russell mess and everything that came with it. For sure. And and yes. now. It's pretty widely known across the league that the the Broncos are in a very difficult spot in terms of how they can spend over the next couple of years uh, because of that disastrous Russell Wilson transaction. And I guess I just disagree just a little bit about like what the expectations are in Denver and when the expectations are lowered because of their unique situation that maybe it's it's not Man. as high a pressure point as other teams. Broncos fans didn't like it going into last season, but I, I'm going to make the same point now is like, where is the strength of this team? Give me a right. position group that has has much. It's a pretty bad roster. I, I might put it in the bottom six in the NFL. Like, I, I think Peyton did a fine job. Sean Peyton, that's why we talk about Kevin Son. Did a fine job coaching up what they had. Um, but there's not a lot There's not a lot to, like, wrap your arms around here and feel feel good about for the Broncos. So th- I'm with you. They, they need some talent infusion. And, if it, and it's tricky, like... Bo Nix as a second rounder feels okay. Bo Nix, if you take him in the you know top fifteen, feels a little rich. Yeah, they definitely need to get better. All right, we started with two bad teams, two sad teams. A bad team and a sad or hmm, Panthers are kind of sad and bad. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, Panthers, Broncos, two teams that are looking up a hill. I want to look at. I want to talk about a team that's in a really the opposite place, but I, I kind of attach some headlines to these. So the headline here is take a window for granted and soon enough it will be a wall. Mm, I like that. Pretty good. Made that one up. Talk about the Packers. And you have Brian Gutekunst. He's been there for a while now. He survived the Aaron Rodgers power struggle. uh, Handled it beautifully looking back on it. Uh, Nailed the Jordan Love pick. 
Uh, you have Matt LaFleur there, his sixth season with the team. So there's been a lot of success in those six seasons, but also they have not gotten to the big one uh, with LaFleur. And, that, and that's this is an organization that expects uh, to get back to the Super Bowl. And last year's the whole last season, they went nine and eight. They closed very strong, obviously. They, they went into the playoffs. They were the team nobody wanted to play. They, they took the gave the Lions all that they could handle. And now it is understood that this is the year that they make that leap. And it better be because I think that these windows, especially with the Jordan Love situation, Greggy, and maybe you could provide just a little clarity because of uh, his situation. Where is he at contract wise? He's entering the second year of a two year contract. They're probably going to give him a new contract this offseason, if I had to guess in the summer. Yeah, and then things get a little more difficult for the Packers. And so what you have uh, with their situation, they have the 25th overall pick and they have a early second round pick. That is the Aaron Rodgers uh, trade. It was going to be a first rounder, uh, but Rodgers didn't reach the percentage of snaps because of his injury, of course. So they get a second rounder. So that is the ninth pick of the second round. They also have the 26th pick of the second round. And they have two third round picks. So that's pretty nice. They have for a team coming off a successful season with a really exciting young core. They now have five picks out of the first 91, Mm. including three in the top 60. Uh, And I think the pressure here is it's not like Gutekunst is going to lose his job, but this is look at the bills as a recent example or what the Lions are now entering as they come into what feels like a big time important year for their organization. I could have talked about the Lions in this exercise. Um, this is kind of the year. And if Gutekunst nails this draft and, and makes smart moves and picks up, uh, hits the first round pick and then gets value in those ever valuable second and third rounds, that could really fill out whatever uh, ills this roster at this point, whether they decide they want to go after an offensive tackle, even though uh, they had a pretty good season from Rashid Walker, who filled in for Bakhtiari. But that's a former seventh round pick. Do you want to upgrade at that position? Do you want to add some uh, help to the defense? You finally made the decision and changed defensive coordinators, but do you want to add more talent there? I suspect that they will, and they'll be aggressive addressing the defense because the offense is in a very good place overall. But this is such a pivotal moment in, in recent Packers history because if you hit this draft, look out. You could be hoisted in Lombardi uh, in February. If you miss on it, you could be the next Bills, the team that could have, would have, should have that was on the make and then never got there. I would just say like one thing though, quick though, because I see your, I see what you're saying that it's, it could swing either way. But um, you know, with the way the Packers operate in general, like I, I would give Goody like an A, if not an almost an A plus on rebuilding the offense because in a way, even though Aaron Rodgers is Aaron Rodgers, it was a little bit of a progress stopper, uh, and we're really only like four months removed from finding out that Jordan Love can play. And, and now I think like the hope hope is um, gushing out of that organization. Well, Rodgers did they, win back to back MVPs before that last season. You no, know, I know, but I guess it's Fairness. more like you like in a way they found a good quarterback in Love, but then you his rookie contract has been eaten up by that situation. I, it's two different things in a way, but like they're pretty conservative with what they do with their front office and stuff. And I, I think Goody has to be as safe a GM as as as, as and well, anyone okay. in the division in a way, but well, but also I like because sure he's been successful. Because I'm not talking about. I don't see this segment as like who's on the hot seat necessarily. Right. It's about like who is in kind of and in many cases it will be, and probably the other teams I bring up it will be. But in in Gutekunst's situation, it's more like here is a moment, and it might not be on everyone's radar that mm-hmm. this kind of could be yeah uh, the year that separates them and makes them a true Super Bowl team. Uh, if he hits it, and uh, it's like a moment in time before Lo- Love gets that big deal. No, I, I thought you said so- that he would be in trouble for some reason if things went, if this draft didn't go well, which maybe you weren't. But he like, would um, live with regret more than he'd be in trouble. Okay, I, I think that's so true that as you were talking and I'm thinking about it, like they have a chance to really set themselves up as the consistent team in the NFC, a young quarterback and a really good young core a lot of which is on offense. That's that's how you win consistently. And when you say, watch out, you turn into the Bills. And part of me thinks like, well, you should be so lucky. I mean, they, they did win like the most amount of games over the last four years. And I don't view the Bills 
story as remotely close. To me, Josh Allen is in the middle of their prime, and, and so their window's open. So consistent winning is what they want. You want to get it a little over the top and, and some good, good picks on defense, especially, I think, in the secondary. Maybe, maybe you get a little younger with the pass rush, but they're a team, unlike the Broncos, where I look around and I, I see a lot of strengths, and I don't see a ton of huge screaming needs. You, you mentioned a couple of them. I, I think they'll definitely address the secondary uh, at some point with those first three picks, but he's in a good spot. I mean, this Damashek does that list of like the greatest positions in sports. And he, you know, he puts like Bruins center and Yankees something. I don't even remember what it was. Center field. It's like, how about Packers GM going from Wolf to Thompson to Gudekunst? You know, that's pretty good. I feel like most of uh, Dave's like cross sports points just circle back to Mario Lemieux. So. Yes, it's, <laughs> it is kind of Penguin all, Center, but, I think, yeah. is like number one all time or something. <laughs> uh, all right, let's take a break and then we will go around again uh, talking about uh, different teams that the uh, decision makers. What am I calling this again? Uh, pressure, pressure points. points. I was decision makers. Team builders. Pretty good. All right, we'll be right back. Oh, right, everybody. Let's never play that Thank again. Thank you <laughs> very much, Greg Rosenthal, who said that. Uh, by the way, Greg, any uh, have you given any thought so far about the Delaware tapes now that they are in the possession of No, uh, I mean, the despite, you know, the firestorm on of interest on social media. Oh, wait, no, I haven't heard from one listener on this thing. Nobody cares. We waited too long for this bit, the... the the, the the desire has really diminished over the years. What Half the listeners are like, was. what's Dan even talking about? It's This is from eight years ago. What a mistake that was. Everyone, <laughs> all the soldiers of the ATN Army, please hit up Greg on Twitter that slash was, was. X we need and help. let him know that you do want to hear the Delaware tapes. And, and, and it would be a win... Come Mark, on, like Glenn. we said, a win for everyone, a win for I, you and I. I think so. I think like, you know, when we're hearing the innocent voices of um, children, uh, you know, we young minds you and hearts asking uh, right. that this be the wish that were fulfilled, not only just for us, but for the future generations. So I, I'm, I, I think it's important. Yeah, yes. that was a rookie mistake by me. Uh, and I know I you're will, not. I will be turning off notifications until Monday, April 15th. All right, so start sending this on Monday, April 15th. No, uh, and I know you're not in it for uh, the the glory, but just think, Greg, that you too could have a signed football from Debo Sweeney. <laughs> like that, me. That's how I it helped, works. I um, potentially played a role in the, I, I'm going to say, uh, an orphanage that was erected. Uh, in in the Clemson region, uh, I'm not sure, but I did play a role because I got that ball. You too could have some type of artifact celebrating your uh, your great uh, philanthropic uh, mind. I, I I think it was thanking you for speaking to the Young Capitalists of America conference or something. So <laughs> let's let's calm down with the orphanage. Young Capitalists of America. <laughs> that is so. That's so false. Uh, so anyway, again, just before we get back to it. Uh, who wins, uh, Mark and I? Uh, who wins, the audience? And who wins, the Santa Monica Food Bank, as an example? Where right. Where we will donate on behalf of Greg if he lets us all hear the Delaware, uh, his his Prague acid rock group from the mid-'90s in high school out of Western Massachusetts. Uh, some of their great work includes, I have it under Delaware bio under stickies on my laptop, uh, how do you want it cooked? Shiny man went to Frogtown. These are all um, uh, uh, output from Delaware. All right, let's get back to it. We must listen to Delaware. Shiny man went to Frogtown. You're up, Greg. Who I'm going to go with Brandon Pressure Bean. point. You know, I started with Carolina. Let's go to a former Panthers staffer here, Brandon Bean, who arrived in Buffalo... After one season of Sean McDermott, he joined his pal there 2018. I think what they've done since McDermott got there could be taught at like a sports business school of how to rebuild a franchise through picks, through trade, through free agency, how to take something where there was basically nothing 
and create a consistent winner. Hopefully, they, you know, for them, they get a Super Bowl eventually, and it really completes that story. But I think he was excellent. But you look at the track record over the last few years, and in the draft specifically, there's just not enough home runs. There's a bunch of singles. Like, Ed Oliver, you, you found a guy who you can kind of build around. That was, that was 2019. For the most part, all their best player, their core players, were found back then when, when they first got there, 17, 18, 19, maybe 20. And since then, they've, they've been hitting singles. He needs to find guys that can be around. Now, they don't pick until late. I've seen some stuff that maybe they trade up for a wide receiver. I think that's crazy because they do have some fifths and sixths in this class where they can trade to move around. But I think they need to find two or three real difference makers in the top 75 picks. Uh, we're going to talk receiver tomorrow, but you know their number one receiver right now out wide is Curtis Samuel or Cleo Shakir. I, I don't even know who oh, it would Jesus. be. Oh, it, Jesus. It's Kincaid. I mean, they need a wide H. receiver. They, they've signaled that they're really happy with their offensive line. They recently signed Lael Collins, too, so I think that's one area they won't hit. But especially in the secondary, the defense, and at wide receiver, they need core guys. They need the bills that are going to help carry Josh Allen to where he has in gone before i think he can do it because he's done it before but they're, they're 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 starting to run out of time i like the draft last year it, it worked out okay but they need to start stacking them i the one thing i don't like about buffalo's situation is when you know less than a month before the draft you created a burning need at, at a you know for an offense that you know you you could say josh allen go do it all on his on his own well no he can't like that's just not how this is going to work and so you you have to go find that wide receiver it's absolutely you need to use it. You might need to trade up if you fall in love with someone, but then you need that wide receiver to like produce right away. I, I just don't love the situation. I think things. I think there is a lot of pressure on the coach. There's a lot of pressure on the quarterback. There's a lot of pressure on the front office. And they were they did Brandon Bean did such a good job building this thing, but they're in a place that they did not plan to be. I don't think on any level right now. And they could. They could make an aggressive move up the board potentially uh, to to grab one of these top wide receivers, uh, but it, it might end up being more likely that with that twenty eighth overall pick, or even in the second round where they pick sixtieth, yeah, they have to be sharper than ever and identify someone that is a uh, high value guy and hope they hit on it. They see, I agree with what you're saying, Mark. They just seem very kind of vulnerable where they where they are right now. And if you were gonna trade digs the timing of it post free agency pre-draft almost just puts more pressure on the organization to to hit on something it's not easy to hit on these guys it's as good as this wide receiver class is and like greg said we're going to talk about that uh in a episode later this week like it's not easy to to land on the guy that actually turns into a big time pro and they need a guy who's going to be a big time pro they're trying to win the super bowl it's not good enough anymore just to go 12 and 5 or 13 and 4 immense pressure in western new york that was a Greggy, uh, Marky. Um, I mean, I think the most interesting spot in the first round is number four, the Arizona Cardinals. And mm. I think with some of these guys, like with Brandon Bean, you can look back and say, well, what have his drafts been? And with Monty Austin Fort, their GM, I'm less concerned with, you know, he doesn't have that track record, but he did. He almost reminds me of our old guy, Sashi Brown, where he came in with a very distinct strategy. They used last year to compile draft picks. Um, they didn't trade Kyler Murray, which was kind of this thing that pe- you know I thought might happen, but they're cool at quarterback, so they're not a candidate to take a quarterback at number four. They um, talk about a team that needs wide receivers. They've got Michael Wilson, who I like, Greg Dortch, who I like, as, these are supporting guys, and, and Chris Moore, essentially. So. You know, there are they're another team that like, well, what do you do? You created this burning need. Um, you could also, I think, obviously trade these picks to the Vikings and get a good wide receiver down down in the down the board a little bit. I guess I just cannot wait to see what they do. They've got eleven picks in this draft, and it's cool to keep accruing them. But to go back to Sashi Brown, because the one thing that kind of comes up is like, I love the strategy because I think it's it's like you're always gonna have a team when you're number four and they have needs all over the place. So recreate this team with young players but that Sashi Brown accruement of draft picks and this is other teams have tried this too it's like you got to hit on them and they missed on a lot there was one draft where they drafted like four wide receivers and a quasi like tight end wide receiver type hybrid and like none of them worked (laughs) none of them worked and like that's only the beginning of how it didn't work so 
I guess what I want to find out is like, Monty Austin Fort, great plan, good strategy. You've got, you sit at the inflection point of the entire first round where you're going to get great value like you did from the Texans a year ago. And you can't argue with that strategy. But then are you the front office, the GM, the group of people to go get the right players? Because if that doesn't happen, you passed on someone like Marvin Harrison Jr. It's like you could get a legit, bona fide, likely Hall of Famer, or you can continue your draft capital building plan. I, I just cannot wait to find out what, what they're offered, what they say yes to, what they say no to, and what they do. They, they have so many needs, and they're just like a little unlucky. Do you remember, I, I, I sort of memory hold this game, but week 17, they were down 21-6 to the Eagles, and Kyler Murray ends up putting up 35 points. This is like, it felt like the bottom of the Eagles season, and yet they had more lengths to go, and they won that game, and yeah, you know, they would have only won three games. I think they would have been two picks higher if they hadn't won that game. And they would be in such a better position here to, to trade that number two pick uh, for a quarterback. Like they could have gotten the farm for it. And, and sometimes it is a little lucky. It's like the Panthers got this this one pick for the Pan. I mean, the Bears got this number one pick for the Panthers being like this bad. No one expected them to be this bad. Uh, so it's just like a little bit of bad luck. And they have so many needs that it's like you could pick any position and they need it other than quarterback. I would say maybe maybe offensive line. They're pretty good. I'll go glass half full in the sense that, uh, yeah, we don't know if, if, if this management, you know, and never forget ownership. And when you look at the teams that are successful and teams that aren't, like, it all connects. Like, can you trust the Arizona Cardinals to make the right decision? And if they were sitting with the number two pick, as you're saying, like, then they have to or more most likely make a decision either to draft a quarterback or they trade out of the pick and maybe they the trade they make is great or maybe it, it makes them overthink things and mess things up. The way it is now, it's almost dummy proof. It's like <laughs> you got in a top flight wide receiver year you need a top flight wide receiver for this quarterback that you paid all this money to go just take Marvin Harrison or whoever you think is the best wide receiver don't overthink it and and get better overnight uh how do you mess this one up like I don't know it I seems agree. like a tough one for even the Cardinals to but to they're block. like I think they're likely I would what, Greg where would you put the odds that they trade it I mean it depends what I think the Vikings are already called them it's like I, I would put it at like sixty percent that they would mm. maybe trade it. That may be a little bit high, but or just lower, add but, like but Justin yeah, Jefferson like 40, or 60. Jamar Chase or a player of that level to your roster right now with your quarterback that you're still trying to figure it out. Like right. I guess that's what I mean. I, I said there's nothing wrong with trading back when there's a quarterback starved team out there and you have to pick up the phone if it it rings, but also like I feel like just taking a potential First team all pro level wide receiver is a, a path to getting a lot better also, you know. And uh to give Mont Monty Austin for credit, look, last year Will Anderson turned out to be great for Houston, but the Cardinals are happy with that trade. They already did a trade down last year and they had a sneaky good rookie class. They got, you know, four or five real contributors, real NFL players. So like they're off to a good start. I think it's a good coaching staff and the GM has done a good job so far. And yeah, Mark, I think it's significant the chances they trade. I'd put it a little lower just because Harrison's so special that it's like 40, 60, but it feels like it could happen for sure. Right. Okay. I got a weird one here in terms of the headline, because I wanted to give a headline for each of these. Yes. The Jaguars. Let's talk about the Jaguars. Little Bartokamus, the Bartaka heads are going off right now. Got Doug Peterson. And I was thinking a headline, for some reason, the phrase, I do not want what I haven't got, just came into my head. And that is that is the title of Sinead O'Connor's 1989 <laughs> album that had, of course, uh, Nothing Compares to You on it. And I'm like, why did I think of that? Why did that just come into my brain? That seems strange. I'm not even like a huge Sinead head. Like, I respect her and rest in peace. And and she's Irish. I I I, lo I love Sinead O'Connor's voice. And but like, it's not like I was a super fan. I don't own an album. So why did I do not want what I haven't got come into my brain? So anyway, apparently it's a you know it's a song off the album. It's it's said to be about finding acceptance for what can't be changed, mm. making peace with loss and limitation and finding the courage to live and to love. And I said, that kind of 
This is about Trevor Lawrence. <laughs> what? Like, are the Jaguars now, we maybe didn't draft the savior of all saviors, and and he's he could he could be very good and but there's some limitations here he's not going to be the the guy that takes you just on his back but you can move on from that you once you know that you have a very good to potentially great quarterback but maybe not a first ballot hall of famer now that we know that we process that and maybe there's some grief involved there but it's not the end of the world you still have a quarterback that 25 teams in the league maybe 23 teams in the league Maybe 20 teams in the league would kill to have. So we move forward. And how do they do that now? They, they, and th th this is, here's a quote. Do we have this quote, by the way, ETP, from Doug Peterson? I, I don't know if I'll ever get over it. I think for me, it's going to be my motivation, my fuel, you know, moving forward. Um, you know, and, and I'm not going to let it cloud the vision, but at the same time, it, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be close in my mind. Um, as, as, I, as I move forward with the team this spring. Doug Peterson was talking about the one and five finish to the mm. season uh, when they were eight and three and on top of the world, they won in Houston on right around Thanksgiving to go to eight and three. And then the wheels fell off and Trevor Lawrence's injury played a big role in that. Uh, but it wasn't the only thing. The defense melted down as well. So now they have to figure out where they're at. And they have, uh, let's see, they have the 17th overall pick. They also... Um, and they have the 48th overall pick in the second round, and then they have a compens compensatory pick in the third round. So they have three picks in the top 96, two in the top 50. Where do, where do you go if you're Balky? Where do you go if you're Doug Peterson, who took the end of that season very personally? You, you're definitely set at quarterback. You believe you got to decide whether you're going to make uh, Trevor Lawrence a uh, you know top five paid quarterback in the league. That's a decision that it's going to be difficult. But what do you do to try to get better in the AFC South and be, as also Peterson said in that press availability at the owners' meetings, like they're back to being the hunter in the AFC South. And um, I'm looking at like move the sticks, mocks, Terry and Arnold, a cornerback out of Alabama uh, to Jacksonville. There's a lot of issues with miscommunications in the secondary, a lot of blown coverages late in the season. So that makes sense. They also the repercussions of a move that a lot of us first guessed at the time, the Trayvon Walker uh, first overall pick when you had Aiden Hutchinson, who seemed like the safer pick because Walker hasn't become the guy they expected him to be. They have a big needed edge rusher still. So I think it's the defense where you focus, but you can't ignore the offense that needs help with uh, Ridley out the door and Trevor Lawrence at a kind of an inflection point in his career. Like who is he? Well, give him the, a, a, the right setup and give him the cast that allows him to maximize what he is. Very important. A lot of pressure on the brain trust in Jacksonville. I'd kind of maybe part of it is like see what type of wide receiver falls to you. Were there 17 mm. you said? Um, yeah, because it is, it's a special draft on that, on, on that note. And like, it, I kind of think it's easier when you're a team that has a couple burning needs. Like they need a wide receiver. They, they need secondary help. Like, you maybe can't go, I mean, you can go wrong with any of these picks, but you probably can't walk away from the first round not feeling good about whoever you add. Like it's, I, I don't hate their spot there. I'm, a, I'm higher on Trevor Lawrence maybe than you are. I, I know what you're saying, but like um, the injury hurt him a lot last year, but he's still like, the, the way he ended the season before outside of the playoff game, like he's 6'6", he can run, he can do Put everything. Way, Mark. Where, where hmm. would you have him in your quarterback rankings right now? Well, so I mean, the QB rank, the QB index is based on like literally the last kind of stuff we so saw. Like from overall, him. Uh, the off season, we just you kind of do one. Yeah, wipe where that. Just, like just like in I, general. I I would say this. I think he has absolute potential to be a top ten quarterback. But where would you put him right now? That's all I'm saying. Twelve. Yeah, and I would too. I would put him in that territory. Mm. And and I'm saying, do you, is it time to give the ghost that you have the uh, top three guy? Or, and, Not yet. And, and That's build all I'd around say. it. Yeah. Just not yet. I mean, that, that would be like a... But by the way, I you can win Super Bowls with a top 10 quarterback, obviously, and many have, so it's not the end of the world. I'm just saying yeah. him as the all-world savior, Peyton Manning type guy, uh, maybe that's the calibration that need or the recalibration that needs to be made. Yeah. I need, to, I need to write the list down, and I feel like I'm lower on Lawrence and consensus, but maybe not in this room. I, feel, I, I think he's still in the top 10. Um, he's probably right around 9 or 10. And that's his play so far, and I think he can get better. I think he's a—he had a lot of good play last year that that they were not 
supporting him early in the season. But they are a weird team. I agree, Mark, that the the, need, the needs aren't that screaming. They're a better version to me of the Broncos, where it's like they're average to good at most spots. Secondary to me is, and especially cornerback, is the biggest need. But they feel like they, they solved something by signing Arik Armstead. But that you know, that's an older player with an injury um, last year. And so you need defensive linemen, even if it's a third edge with Walker and Allen, or if it's a d- defensive tackle. And they would have loved to keep Ridley so that receiver wasn't a need. But now you you go into it with a need. Like I, I think Lawrence is emblematic of this whole team. It's sort of in the middle. They spent a lot at, on the offensive line, and it's not a bad line, but they've spent a lot of resources for it to just be eh. Uh, and you know, their guy, our guy, Balky, our guy, you know, he survived a lot of different power struggles. Do you know who the coach was when Trent Balky entered the building there? Don't be ridiculous. It was no, Doug Marone. It was, you know, Marone. He, he was there with Marone. My urban Meyer kept him around as like, okay, you can kind of be my, uh, guy who takes care of that side of things. Uh, Daryl Bevel, remember he was an interim head coach there for a while, and now he's still here with Peterson. He had all those power struggles in San Francisco. He supposedly wants a team that's like bigger and tougher and stronger and faster than everyone, and I don't quite see that. They're they're very middle of the pack. Hmm. I agree. That's a, you know, it's time to figure some things out there. All right. Good stuff. Let's take a break, and we'll wrap things up. All right, we're back. Uh, oh, and by the way, we're still, you know, Colleen has been missing for about 45 to 50 minutes now. And uh, it's, I think, where we're at now, Mark, it's gone from a, uh, a search and rescue to, a, I hate to say this, a search and recovery. Well, yeah, I mean, I think part of the difficulty is that we're still, you know, locked in our chairs trying to produce the show while realizing that we've lost our friend. And so we're going to have to shift into full investigation mode after the show. But if you can find the Delaware tapes, I believe we can find mm. like a five foot one blonde. There have I been mean, reports the- <laughs> out there uh, from various police scanners on the east side of Los Angeles that there's been witnesses to a young um, blonde woman talking about Quesi Adolfo Mensa's uh, third year in his rebuild that, that it's kind of go time. Uh, so I do feel like that might be a, a little bit of a clue for where to find her. <laughs> just talking just on the street, street, street corner. It's a little worrisome. Um, Colleen's become like the gone girl of this podcast over the last couple of weeks. <laughs> we just got to find her and hope she's okay. Um, all right. That is it for the Wednesday show. And, uh, we'll be back a little later in the week. As we said, we're going to continue our draft uh, wormhole and, and and really dig in on one of the most exciting positions uh, or maybe the, it depends, quarterback, wide receiver, uh, position groups in this draft, uh, which is wide receiver. So that's coming up later this week. Anything else to add, boys, before we say goodbye? Never. Right. Been a pleasure. Been a, as always, as always. <laughs> and, and Mark, again, not constructive criticism, uh, but just a suggestion about your background on uh, on remote. You have uh, put it on my radar um, fully, and I am going to think about how to address it. Oh, and let me underline this with uh, my wife got back to me. The dog rescue place is Love Leo Rescue. If you are in the Southern California area, uh, it is an incredibly run organization that really put the pet First, uh, adopt a dog, save a life. Love Leo Rescue is a non-based profit based, a non-profit based in Los Angeles. Uh, We believe all dogs deserve a second chance. So check out loveleorescue.org. That's where I got my beloved captain and they do amazing work. So check that out. And uh, until uh, next time, heed the call. Where are you, Connie? Hey guys, thanks for listening to this episode of the Around the NFL podcast. (laughs) I can't wait to do the same. I'd like to thank producer Eric Roberts for going into the office on an off day just so I'd have everything I need to do the show remotely. Eric, we tried our best. To Greg, thanks for sending out the news items so early. It's a true hero move. You know me so well. To Mark, my brother in anxiety. Thanks for probably over-preparing today. You're always ready for anything and everything. 
I just wish I could say that about my internet provider, especially today. And to Dan, who never stops believing that my remote appearances could maybe work this time. You miss all the shots you don't take, and we've taken a whole lot of shots. So good times, gang. Uh, we'll reconvene in studio to properly heed the call. And now I gotta go. I'm gonna go throw my computer into the sea.